All right. Okay, guys. So <clears throat> cooling systems. The cooling system is designed to do what essentially? What, what, what is the purpose of the cooling system? We want to maintain the temperature of the engine, right? Cooling system will maintain the temp of the engine, okay? So when we talk about temperature, we're talking about heat or energy, right? So what, what are the sources of heat energy from the engine? So we get heat from the combustion chamber. Combustion. I'm just going to put combustion because essentially that's where it's coming from. Where else does the heat come from? Say it again. Friction. Anything else? What, say it again. Exhaust. So uh, I'm going to call, I'm going to include combustion. It's going to include pressurized gas, burning of the fuel, and the hot exhaust. Does that sound okay? Combustion will, the entire process, okay? And friction. Those are the two main, main sources of heat energy in the engine, okay? So when we talk about heat energy, we're talking about moving heat from the combustion chamber to where? And then from the radiator, where does it go? Right, so we take that heat from the combustion chamber to the radiator into the ambient air, okay? That's the entire purpose of the cooling system. So I'm gonna draw a rough sketch of the, of the cooling system here and then we're going to kind of discuss it. And then we're going to get into more detail about how each component uh, 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 operates and functions. Uh, and then we'll go out and we're going to start our testing on the cooling system. Okay. Uh, so, so we know we have an engine. This is our engine. Okay. The engine produces heat. In the engine, we have a top is a cylinder head. The bottom is the block, right? Um, how do we get water to move through the engine? Water pump, right? So usually on the front of the engine here, there's a WP stands for water pump, okay? And traditionally in the olden days, off of the water pump, because the water pump's belt driven, you would have this guy, what's this guy? Fan, All right? So we have a fan. All right, so we have a water pump moves water through the engine. Where does the water come from? You said reservoir? Reservoir, what'd you say? The radiator, right? So we got a radiator. There's also a reservoir. I'm just going to write radiator, okay? We'll also have, we'll explain it later. This is called a overflow uh, reservoir. Reservoir. Okay. Say it again. Uh, it's under the hood. It's usually near the radiator on the left or right of the radiator. Okay. Well, th there's two places to put the coolant, okay? We're gonna use the words coolant, antifreeze, and water interchangeably for this conversation. Is that okay? Okay. Real world, water is the clear stuff. 
antifreeze is the colored stuff. When we mix it together, it becomes coolant. Okay, but for this conversation, we'll use the words interchangeably. Sound fair? Okay. Sometimes it just rolls off the tongue easier when you say coolant or water. So, <laughs> um, all right. So this radiator has a cap. Okay, well, it has a filler neck. And on the filler neck, there's a cap, right? And then off of the engine, what regulates the temperature of the engine? It starts with a T. What's the part that starts with a T? The thermostat, right? So we'll usually have a part that looks like this. And inside of here, there's a part. I'm just going to draw it roughly like this. This is going to be our thermostat. All right. So we need to connect all this stuff together, okay? So typically the thermostat has a hose that goes from the thermostat housing to the top of the radiator. This is called your upper radiator hose. Okay, and then the water pump typically has a hose that comes from the bottom. And this is your lower radiator hose. Question so far? All right. So I'm just watching the time here so I can be mindful of what we got, what else we got to do tonight. Yes. They're large diameter hoses. Yeah, usually one and a half to two and a half inches. Yeah, we're going to move a lot of water through the system. Yeah, small hose, small engine. Big hose, big engine. Diesel trucks have big hoses. Hondas have little baby hoses. Okay, because a smaller engine produces less heat energy. So we have to remove less heat. Make sense? We're gonna talk about that because the water pump is pulling water from the radiator. Right? If it pulls water faster than it pushes it out, that hose will collapse. So it's normal. Have you ever got an Oreo shake from Jack in the Box? Yeah? Or a milkshake with cookies? Yes. And then you're sucking on the straw, and then a cookie gets in the straw. What happens to the straw? Yeah. Yes. Same idea. So if your radiator is plugged, or if there's a restriction somewhere, that hose can collapse. Or some vehicles are designed with a restriction, so they put a spring in the hose so the hose does not collapse. The spring holds the shape of the hose. So it's, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It's like a car moving, no problem. What's normal? It's not supposed to collapse. Because if this collapses, is there coolant moving through the system? Yes. Not if it's pinched all the way. Right? If that closes down. That could happen, but it's not supposed to. There should be there should be a method that's keeping that from happening. What's up, Ryan? Here, let me pause this real quick. No, you're good. Okay, so the other piece, the other component in this system, this is a very, a very simple drawing. Cooling systems can get more complicated than this as we get more modern, but this is a very traditional drawing. This reservoir has a small hose that goes to the bottom of the tank to here, to here, okay? So, let me pause this. I'm going to go grab a couple of markers that are different colors. 
Okay, so when we look at this diagram, this is as basic as it gets, right? So in the radiator is where we keep our water, right? So the water in the radiator should be cold or hot? It should be leaving the radiator cold. Do you agree? Okay, so what happens here is we have, we do a couple of uh, cold down arrows, cool water comes down this lower radiator hose into the water pump, and the water pump pushes cold water into the engine block. Okay. This water goes around the cylinders. See, if you look inside the engine block, there's water jackets around the cylinders. Okay. And then it moves up towards through the cylinder head. As this water moves up through the cylinder heads, the water absorbs heat. Think of heat as something that I can pass on, right? If I take a cold beverage, okay, and I set it on a warm table, does the table absorb the cold or does the cold absorb the heat out of the table? The, the cold absorbs the heat because when I move this cup, right, that part of the table is cold. This cup pulled the heat out of the table. You guys with me? That's how we got to think of heat, right? All right. So as this water moves through the engine, right around here at the cylinders, it's going to start absorbing heat and it's going to become warm. As that water absorbs heat, once it reaches normal operating temperature, which is determined by the thermostat, that hot water will move from the engine into the radiator. And then that water cools off and the process starts over. Is everybody following this? Very simple, right? But my car overheats, should I replace the thermostat? possibly, right? Or your water pump could have a broken impeller or your radiator could be clogged or your hose could be collapsed or the block could have a restriction or the head could have a restriction. That hose could have a restriction. Your cap could be bad. It's just like the other thing we talked about before class, right? It could be a whole list of things. So when somebody says, hey, my car overheats, what do you think it is? I think it needs a diagnostic. I think every component needs to be inspected and tested to identify what the problem is, right? So this is the basics of how the system works. So let's talk physics for a minute. What happens to water when it reaches a certain temperature? It changes form, right? So what form does it change from what to what? It changes from a liquid to a gas at what temperature? No, well, it's not 300. Water boils. I'm talking about degrees Fahrenheit. 212. What'd you say? 200? It's, two, it's 210 to 212, depending on your elevation. So we're going to say 210 degrees Fahrenheit, just for a nice round number. Okay. Four, for every pound of pressure on the cooling system, that number goes up. So when we pressurize the cooling system, hence we have a cap that might hold up to 15 PSI, right? So for every one pound of pressure, we increase the boiling point by a certain amount. I think it's uh, one pound is like two and a half to three PSI. I'm gonna have to look it up. Don't hold me to that. But I do know that on our race car, we used to go like 17 to 18 PSI caps and we can get it to like 260 and the water wouldn't boil. Okay, so that's pretty significant. Um, so, so as this water gets hot, the thermostat will open at a predetermined number, right? So when we look at thermostats, there's gonna be a stamp on the thermostat and it's gonna say this thermostat opens at this temperature. So that thermostat's gonna stay closed until this water reaches that temperature. 
So what happens when the thermostat's closed? That water pump's still rotating. Can we stop it from rotating while the engine's on? No, right? We can't stop it from rotating. So what happens if that's blocked, water's not moving through the radiator, okay? So our first start in the morning, the engine's cold. We want that engine to warm up fast, right? So somewhere in the block, there's normally a little, little hose, we call this a bypass. Okay, so then water will cycle through the bypass like so. Okay, so we start that engine cold in the morning, instead of water going through the radiator, because it'll never warm up if the water goes through the radiator. Okay, water just bypasses and bypasses and bypasses until we, the thermostat reaches normal operating temperature, then the thermostat opens, then the cycle starts. Yes, sir. The question is, will the bypass hose close off or will it stay open? The bypass hose usually stays open, but the way the engine is designed is the bypass hose is usually much smaller in the opening for the thermostat, so there's more restriction. So the coolant is going to follow the path of least restriction. Okay. And then sometimes they're they're kind of designed where if that thermostat opens, maybe that thermostat will kind of block that opening a little bit, anyways. Okay. It's never a hundred percent seal. Okay, but it usually is least resistance to the radiator. Any other questions before I move on? All right. So, so let's look here. In the engine, we got a head gasket in there. That seals the head to the engine block, okay? Then we go to our thermostat and we have this bypass hose, okay? The water pump is usually just a shaft with an impeller. The impeller is just kind of like a blade and it uses centrifugal force to push the water outwards. So as water comes into the middle, it pushes the water out and that forces it through the block, okay? Very simple design, a couple things happen. One, if there's electrolysis, meaning the coolant has become acidic, it can actually eat away the fins on the water pump. So that water pump's spinning, but there's no fins to push the water. So you got no flow. The water pump shaft can seize up where the water pump's not spinning. Sometimes it looks like it's spinning, but the shaft inside is not spinning, okay? That's a seized water pump, no water flow. Those are a couple of things that can happen. The other more common thing that happens with water pumps is they just leak. They have a seal and they'll start dripping and they'll leak and you'll need to replace your water pump. That in my experience has been the most common thing. I've also seen in, uh, in more rare circumstances where the impeller and the shaft actually separate, where you take it apart, everything looks good, but if you hold the shaft and turn the impeller by hand, they're two separate pieces, but it looks like one piece, okay? So when we do a water pump inspection, if we're, if we're suspecting we have a flow issue, we always gotta put the water pump in that equation, okay? <clears throat> so a bypass hose is usually a rubber hose with clamps that could leak or rupture like any other hose upper and lower radiator hoses and bypass hoses and heater hoses all fall into the same category. So just to give you a little bonus here, a heater core is like a little mini radiator, okay? So the heater core is going to take hot water from the cylinder head And as that hot water moves through the heater, we're going to blow some air through there, right? So this is cool air. So that cool air goes in. The cool air goes through that little mini radiator. It's going to absorb heat from that radiator. And then we're going to get warm air Okay, 
And then what happens to the water in the heater core? It doesn't dissipate. The water's still there. The water gets hotter or cooler? The air is taking the heat from the radiator. The water is going to get cooler, right? So then we pump this back into the block. Has anyone ever heard that if you turn on your heater, it'll keep the car from overheating? It's like a little extra radiator, the heater, right? True story, my 1986 Dodge, going up the grapevine, towing my trailer, gas pedals to the floor for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Air conditioner is going middle of summer. It's like 112 degrees out. Everybody's like sweating because my truck's like 30 years old and, and it's just not really designed to be used that way, right? But I, I have a good radiator, I have an old radiator in it. It used to be a good radiator. Temp starts climbing up. And I looked at my wife, I said, we're gonna have to turn on the heater. What? But guess what? I kept my foot to the floor. We lowered the windows, I cranked the heater to full and the temperature started going down. Why? Because that heater core was removing heat from the engine. It was putting it in the cabin where we didn't want it but we protected the engine, right? We brought plenty of water. I told the kids, drink water, be quiet. Just kidding. I'm not that cool, right? We did it, we did it, and then I slowed down and we let everybody cool off. All right, so that's how the heater works, okay? That's a different class. When you take HVAC, you're gonna learn, you're still going to inspect your heater hoses during a cooling system service. These hoses can crack, split, and leak the same as radiator hoses, okay? So here we go. So we got this water, got this water pump pushing water through the block. Thermostat. The thermostat's just a little trap door. When we're working out in the lab, I'll show you a thermostat, but you can see it's just got a little opening and there's a plate. There's a little spring as it expands, the door opens and closes. Okay. When we reach the engine operating temperature, most engines are around 190 degrees on the thermostat. That opens. The hot water is allowed to go through the upper radiator hose into the radiator. This fan is going to pull air through the radiator. So out of the radiator, we're taking this hot air and this hot air gets pushed under the car. See, a lot of people don't realize, but your engine compartment is designed to pull air in through the grill, down the firewall, under the car. So all those little shields that are under the engine compartment are designed to direct the air a certain direction to cool off the radiator, the exhaust manifolds, the catalytic converter to keep those parts as cool as possible. So if you're working on something and you have a plastic cover and you're like, oh, I forgot to put this on. Oh, we don't need it. You could have just messed yourself up in the long run. Okay. What was your question, Shanta? So it takes the hot air, right? And then on this side, what do we have going into the radiator? Cool air in. Seeing it? Okay. The radiator is just a box with a bunch of skinny tubes going up and down. So as that water runs down the tubes, there's little fins that connect them. Those fins absorb the heat from the water. The air blowing past those fins takes the heat out of the fins. Okay, so essentially what we're doing is we're conducting the heat from the water into the fins, into the air. So what we're doing essentially, uh-oh, What we're doing essentially is we are taking gasoline, converting it into motion, converting as much as we can into motion, and the leftover byproduct is heat. One of the byproducts is heat. We release that heat into the atmosphere. Okay? Yes, sir.
No, the thermostat is a little door that opens and closes. When the engine's hot, it opens. When the engine cools off, it closes. So all the thermostat does is start the flow of water and stop the flow of water. The fan in this drawing is mechanical. We're gonna talk about fans after this, okay? Because So there's, there's many different types of fans. There's a direct drive fan, which is what I've drawn, where the fan is always spinning. So the only way this fan would fail is if the water pump fails or if the blade got broken. Okay, the other type of fan uses what they call a viscous coupler, which is a clutch, a mechanical clutch or fan clutch, so that when the hot air that's coming through the radiator hits that fan clutch, it engages the fan, then the fan starts spinning. But then when the radiator cools off, the fan disengages. So the fan still looks like it's spinning, but it's not connected. It's just kind of freewheeling. That saves fuel economy because the engine's not spinning the fan. Only when it's hot does it spin the fan. Does that make sense? And what's the other option, our most modern option? Electric fans. Okay. So we're, we're going to spend more time on fans later tonight. Okay. But those are the three uh, types of fans. The most modern one is the electric fan. Yes, every car on this lot has fans on the radiator. Um, there is one other type that you actually might see in specialty vehicles, usually diesel engines, uh, and that is hi hydraulic fans. They're driven by a hydraulic motor. Instead of an electric motor, they use the, like a power steering pump to drive the fan. Like a door? On the like, front side yeah, or on the front, back side? No, front. It's like open, but then like sometimes close. What kind of car? Can you give me an example? Uh, A fusion hybrid. So, what some manufacturers may do for cold weather climates is have something that blocks the radiator. Right. So if you block the radiator, there's there's two there's two reasons to do this. So the first one is cold weather. If you live in cold weather, Alaska, Antarctica, cold weather, you want to block that radiator so the engine can stay warm. So you might only leave one fourth or half of the radiator exposed to the air. Have you ever seen those semi trucks? Did anybody ever see ice road truckers? Right, and they have that big cover in front of the radiator, and then they would just like crack a corner open. Okay, so they put these big plastic covers in front of the radiators to keep the engines warm because it's so cold. It's outside of the grill, for the example I'm using. You're talking about something that was made with the car. Yeah, so it has if it has a sensor. It might have, it'll open and close, and that probably helps to warm up the engine faster. The faster we can warm up the engine, the sooner it goes into closed loop where it's running the most efficient, okay? The other option is on some fan shrouds, the, there's an opening for the fan, right? And the radiator is a rectangle shape, but the fan is round. So you have these three triangles in the corners. So sometimes they'll have flaps that close when you're going at slow speeds because you want the fan doing all the work. But when you're driving at high speeds, those little flaps open, and then it allows you to use the entire radiator to cool the engine. Does that make sense? Those are the two examples that I can think of right now. If there's another example you guys read about, please let me know, because that's all I know about. That would, that, those would be the only reasons to block the radiator. Okay. Anybody else before I move on? There's a few more components here I wanted to talk about. No, you're good. You're good. Reservoir. I'm glad you asked. Okay. So we have hot water. 
what happens to things when they get hot? They expand, right? So as the hot water expands, it's gonna build up pressure in the system, right? So the water is gonna get bigger. This cap is gonna usually around one atmosphere or around 15 PSI, that cap's going to open to release the pressure, okay? That extra water is gonna go through this tube into the reservoir. In this reservoir, you have a full line, okay? So when the engine's hot, the water in this reservoir is high. When the engine's cold, you park the car, it cools off. The water in the cooling system contracts and it takes water from the reservoir back into the cooling system. So this is always full. So the cap holds pressure, but it also allows vacuum. Let's talk about the radiator for a minute and the construction of the radiator. If I took this radiator and I kind of cut the top off when we were looking down, here's what we would see. We would see tubes Those are the tubes in the radiator. The water is in these tubes. So when a radiator is plugged up, it's because calcium deposits or other foreign material get stuck in here. And then there's no room for water to move through the tube. So these are very small. It's like a tiny, like one of those little coffee straws. Okay. When I turn this and look at it the other way, you have these skinny tubes. And then you have fins that go like this. And that's what the air goes through, are those skinny tubes, or those skinny fins. You guys visualize this? So when you look really close, you can see this. You should be able to see right through those. Over the years, insects, trash, road grime, they start to plug up those fins. So part of our cooling system inspection is to shine a light on the radiator. We want to see, are any of the fins smashed? Are there bugs? Can we see light through it? I used to take my air hose and go from the fan side. I'd stick my arm in there and I'd blow air backwards through the radiator or water hose shh, blow water through the radiator backwards wash it out if i had so some some radiators have a transmission cooler built into them if those cooler lines leak they get transmission fluid on like a bottom corner what does oil do with dirt it attracts it oil attracts dirt so if i have a transmission cooler line leaking near the radiator, I might have a quarter of that radiator plugged up because the oil has been collecting dirt over the last six months since it's been leaking. So I'm going to fix the cooler lines and I'm going to tell the customer I need an extra 30 minutes to clean your radiator. And you charge them for that extra time. Or if you're doing it yourself, know that, hey, this is dirty and messy. I need to clean it for my radiator to work properly. This is the simplest we can make a cooling system diagram here. This is the basic idea of how it works. So we have a water pump, thermostat, fan, the engine itself could have a blown head gasket causing or crack causing issues. We have hoses and a radiator and a radiator cap that I'm gonna teach you to test. And then I have an overflow reservoir. Where essentially it's a visual inspection. If the reservoir is cracked or broken or won't hold water, it needs to be replaced. Yes, sir.
this system does not have a coolant filter. The cooling system should always be clean water. New antifreeze uh, formulas and mixtures is supposed to go five years or 100,000 miles. Some manufacturers even say the lifetime of the car. There, go ahead. On the radiator, it has a pet cock, so you can drain it, yeah. If it, it yeah, I reuse it. I reuse it if I can. Um, personally, on my cars, I try to change all the fluids every 30,000 miles. Here's what happens with coolant. You can actually check coolant for freezing, freezing um, protection, right? So if you're going to Big Bear next weekend, it's gonna be cold, right? You wanna make sure your water in the engine doesn't freeze. So freeze protection is how cold can the water in the system get before it freezes? We have a tool called a hydrometer to check that, okay? The other um, things we measure are um, electrolysis. We can measure the coolant for, vol for voltage. If the voltage is above 100 millivolts or 0.1 volts, it's too high. That means the system has become corrosive. We can also check the pH of the antifreeze, which essentially does the same thing with little test strips where we dip it in and we can look at the pH. Um, You just take a voltmeter and you put one end to the negative side of the battery and the other end, you, you just dip it in the water. You don't touch just in the radiator. You just dip it in, touch the water. Don't touch the sides, just the water. It'll show you volts. If it's 0.1 volts or higher, you should replace it. 0.1. You should flush it out, put clean antifreeze and uh, new, new coolant. Correct, 0 0.1 volts, also known as 100 millivolts. Any other questions? Over time, over time, so water by itself is corrosive, right? With antifreeze, it gives it, it has uh, anti-corrosion inhibitors. It protects the engine from corrosion. But over time, those additives break down. So it will become corrosive again, okay? That's the main reason, but also modern engines, they have coil on plug ignition systems. They have um, fuel pumps, electric fuel pumps, high current alternators. So we have all this electrical current running through the engine. <clears throat> Who's taken basic electrical? What is a battery made up of? Anybody? Water and Okay, so you got the acid, which is also referred to as water in a battery. Okay, there's two other main components or materials. Did you say it? Well, plastic is the housing, right? But you have two different types of lead. You have lead acid. Oh, you have acid, right? And then you're gonna have what they call sponge lead. And then I forget the name of the other type of lead, but it has, um, the sponge lead has an absence of negative ions and the other type of lead has an abundance of negative ions. So you have two different types of metal and acid. So as the water in this system, as the pH changes over time because it's getting used, okay? We might have a radiator that's made of aluminum 
in an engine block that's made of steel. They're imbalanced metals. When we run current through the engine, some of that current in stray voltage gets caught up and it starts charging the cooling system. This is how we can measure voltage in the water. That is electrolysis. Okay. Some manufacturers have been able to figure that out by grounding everything very well, but not every manufacturer has figured it out. Or sometimes a ground might be missing or loose. So it's always a good idea to inspect the coolant and replace it when needed. Even if it says lifetime coolant, you still should be checking it with a hydrometer, checking the voltage to identify if it needs to be replaced. And smell it and look at it. If it looks like mud or smells like dead fish, it's probably time to replace it. Okay. Spill drain? So when I open the drain cock on the radiator, it's going to drain the radiator, the hoses, it's going to drain the entire system up to the bottom of the water pump. About right here. So are you supposed to remove the, the hoses to get near the well, the hose, see how this hose is down? Yeah. So your water level, so if your drain pops here, your water level stops here. Yeah. So you're going to have some water in the hose, but you're also going to have some water stuck in the block. So the engine block should also have a plug called a, dr a block drain. So you take that plug out and then you can drain the engine block. There's usually one on each side. On these engines, you'll see it. You'll see there's a little block drain on the side. That engine has it there. Underneath the cylinder head. Back. No, go back, go back. You're close. No, up, up from there. Up. It has like a little straw and a little brass screw in the middle. That right there is your block drain on the Toyotas. Yeah, the Toyota uses fancy ones. But on some engines, it's just a plug. Looks like a bolt. One on each side. So that is the proper way to so do a cooling system. That should be enough. Yeah, that should drain 90 to 95% of the liquid. Then refilling it is the next issue, right? Because you got to get all the air out of the system. When we drain the water out, we got to get the air and all the water back in. So when we look at Mitchell or the factory service manual, there's going to be a procedure to burp or bleed the air out of the cooling system when we refill it. Any other questions? All right. I'm going to stop this recording so it can start loading. So let's see here. We're going to stop.